Hello, everybody. Final round in day one of the Hartford, Connecticut Pokemon Regional Trading Card Game Championships. I'm Kirk Dubes Nax Dubay, bringing you this round nine action along John Calchexis Kettler. We have a true win and in scenario. Both players at 17 points can't draw and guarantee themselves in, so they are going to play it out and try and get to 19 points, guarantee themselves that day two berth. That's correct, and you know, up until this point, we hadn't seen a whole lot of Hitmonchan throughout the day, but now we're seeing it coming in strong in these really crucial rounds. We saw it last round with Zach Lesage playing against Kieran with his Sableye deck. This time we have a true winning in for day two with Rob Guerrero versus Azul Garcia Griego, one of the most well-known players in the game with Zoroark Garbodor. So it should prove to be a pretty interesting, exciting match. Absolutely. Uh, Azul, good game. Uh, a little bit far off from his uh, towering splash GX highlight reel moment that he had in Greensboro, uh, but chose uh, Zoroark Garbodor as his weapon this weekend. And uh, Rob Guerrero sticking with kind of what was popularized at the beginning of the format with uh, the uh, Hitmonchan uh, Wabafet hit and run deck. Yeah, and you know, going down the list, it looks pretty typical to what we've seen before. I mean, we of course, we have the base of Hitmonchan and Wabafet, along with all of the litany of text and single copy cards. So here we are in the action now. All right, looks like Azul drew for the turn. I believe he is going first. Tapu Lele, not the card he wants to see in the active. Draws for turn and a pass. You hate to see that. Rob Guerrero drawing for... Their turn, Hitmonchan coming down, and now Azul knows exactly what's going on because there's only one deck that plays that card in the format. Muscle Band hits the Hitmonchan, and Rob, just by playing cards and that computer search, going to have a pretty decent start here uh, in round nine, game one. Yes, sir. Now, one thing we haven't seen quite as much of in the list is that copy of Hoopa from Shining Legends being able to hit and run with Hitmonchan to bring that Shining Legends Hoopa up to shield itself and protect itself from EX and GX Pokemon. So a pretty effective way to hold off on damage being dealt to you by, well, of course, one of the most aggressive types of cards in the game that nearly everyone uses to attack with. It helps against Picarom, helps against this matchup too. Um, Floatstone coming down on Wobbuffet. Uh, Professor Sycamore for Rob going to draw seven here, just looking for an energy energy to start putting pressure on that Tapu Lele. Shrine of Punishments as well, going to tick up the damage in between turns. Rob likes to put down another Hitmonchan and a Gumi. And strong energy. That is a good Sycamore for Rob. Steps up, hit and run. That's 30, 50, 70. Going on to that Tapu Lele, Shrine Tick in between turns. We're at 80 damage, and Azul needs to play a card oh, here. What is he sitting on with just a draw past? He, okay, well, he's got the Mysterious Treasure, so I don't think that he... It, I don't think it can be that bad, can it? It, it might be. He does play two copies of Tapu Lele GX, so may have a way out. However... If that Lele is prized, Azul might just be stuck in the starting blocks. Yeah, I mean, like, you, you can't help but feel for a situation where not only you would have a bad start. Oh, and it's, well, the Lele is there in his deck, so you know at the very least he isn't going to be caught in a complete dead draw scenario right now. But it's incredibly awkward and totally not favorable to be in. But getting those Pokemon with Bridget, being able to get a quick look through his deck, quick search to see what all might be prized of the crucial single copies and important lines. But now he's got a board going, so it's just a temporary setback. Azul shuffling up after, as you mentioned, Tapu Lele using the Wonder Tag ability, grabbing Bridget and putting Azura, Azura, and a Trubbish onto the bench. Field Blower's going to hit Shrine of Punishment and perhaps that Float Stone, seeing if uh, Azul can uh, stem this hit and run action a little bit on Rob's side of the board uh, by making it a little bit more difficult to retreat and a pass. Yeah, and so even though that was a stuttered turn at the beginning, that was a, definitely a stuttered setup because he's a turn behind on being able to get out Zoroark's trades, all that good stuff. But he's functioning. He's he's getting along there. He's he's getting to where he needs to be, even if it takes a while. Rob benches uh, Wabafet has another float stone in hand, and this is going to be 70 damage, tick up 80, 160. That Tapu Lele has a lot of damage on it right now. Yeah, and skimming through Azul's list, I'm looking for any type of healing option. 
I don't really see a direct option to do so, but he actually runs three copies of Parallel City. I think that could be relevant later on here is a counter to Shrine of Punishment. Being able to simultaneously counter that is a threat, yet at the same time discard those severely damaged Tapu Leles to get them out of the out of play. And so by doing that, he can protect himself and keep his momentum going. Azul uses Guzma to pull up the Hitmonchan. Zorak GX trades away a parallel city, draw two. Floatstone traded away, draw two. And now Azul, as we know from the first turn, does have a DC in hand. Um, has this knockout unlocked if he wants it and says, I do, KO. Shrine of Punishment is gone. Uh, so no, nothing takes up in between terms. So for, for now, that Zorark is safe on the bench. That's for sure, although it looks like with uh, Rob's got plenty of options, and truthfully, and we've talked about this before, there isn't a whole lot involved in the initial setup, so it really comes down to how you're able to consistently chain your hits and how they work in the matchup. And we have that Gumi tech being able to come in, factor in incredibly here, by coming out into the active position, it's going to force Zorark to have two energies attached to it. it. Excuse me, two energy cards attached to it in order to be able to attack because it increases the cost of the attack by one. So that riotous beating is going to be costing three colorless. Rob, before passing the turn, does put down a Kartana GX to slice off the double colorless energy off of the Zorark, meaning that it is now, as you mentioned, two attachments away from being able to attack into this Gumi. Um, and with the Zorark in the active holding no energy, that is a tall order to ask. Yeah, although luckily with Azul's list and just Zorark decks in general, he's got plenty of options. He doesn't have nearly as much stress on him at the moment, but if we get into a situation where the Gumi is one of the last things in play, then it might be a little bit harder. But at any rate, Azul's got plenty of gusting options, ways to switch out Rob's Pokemon and keep up prize bowling here. Garbotoxin Garbodor gets traded away, followed by an Ultra Ball traded away. Azul getting a full comprehension of what his hand's going to look like after those trades before he makes any decisions. Mysterious Treasure looking to pitch a Field Blower. And we're going to see what Azul good game finds. And he says, I need a Trash Lanch Garbodor. Pick it up. Is he going to put it down? We do, we do see the Psychic Energy versus Seeker. <laughs> DC falling, uh, but psychic energy is what's attached. We body got a body building dumbbells. The spice in Azul's list, among other people's lists at this tournament, that body building dumbbells to be able to increase the HP of your stage one Pokemon by 40. So it's going to be a tall order for anything in Rob's deck to knock out that Garbodor with 160 HP now. Gumi coming up again for Rob. Um, is it Sticky Membrane? Is that the uh, yes. ability on that Gumi? Adding uh, adding a one colorless energy to the attack cost of your opponent's Pokemon? Yeah, and you know what? That works out pretty well when your cost is just one energy as opposed to two. It isn't nearly as much of an issue with Zorark having to basically fiddle around trying to find a second energy card to do anything. Rob has to put the Gumi in the active to try and... Uh, do a little work here, buy himself a little time to uh, cobble together his game plan. However, much would much rather have a Wobbuffet up there and stopping those trades from Azul's side because now that he has them built up, his deck is uh, slowly and surely gaining some momentum here. Yep, we've got a fully matured board here by Azul. Not really worrying too much in terms of what can or cannot deal with him. Although, let's go ahead and play devil's advocate here in terms of what Rob can do. He still has a couple things waiting in the wings. He's still got that copy of Neo Lego. He still has, with each of these hit and runs that he does, he could threaten a 90 damage hit with Hitmon Lee to follow up with the Hitmon, with, with Hitmon Chan's hit, hit, hit and run. And in addition to all of that, we've also got Buzzwool being able to hit for massive amounts of damage due to the current prize status of the game. Rob Guerrero, we just watched him resolve an adventurous bag, and the two tools he grabbed were Choice Band and Muscle Band just to pass over to Azul, and he does have the DCE if he wants to kind of go over the top and be able to attack with the Garbotox and Garbodor, but first, 
Evo Soda gets traded away to give Azul two more cards and another look at it. And now we're seeing what's happening. Trade number two is that Ultra Ball pitching away um, to retrieve. I believe that was an escape rope and maybe a parallel city that he drew off of that. I think so. But it, yep, and there we go. We have that. We, we, we have him. <laughs> we we have him furiously pick up the Gumi to make sure he's getting it exactly right. Drops down that double to go ahead and make sure everything's all good. And we see him going for that aggressive play. I wouldn't call it greedy. Definitely aggressive though. Knocking out that Gumi. He could have waited around a little bit. Oh, and I I like the Faba play here because that was. Rob's one real way to get in range of a Zorok GX knockout with Hitmonchan. Now that it's gone, removed from play in the Lost Zone, Rob can't do that. And maybe he's just going to have to rely on a tiny little hit against Garb. I don't really think that helps too much. No, after Rob's turn one, uh, where he had uh, quite a lot going on on his side of the board, um, after that Sycamore hasn't been able to find another draw supporter. So that's that's a little tough look. Muscle Band adding 20 damage and a Prism Energy uh, going to kind of allow Hitmonchan to at least do a version of Hit and Run, not its uh, fully powered up version that you like to see with Choice Band, Strong Energy, and um, Deancey. There you go. Thank you. That, that I was, was going to say uh, Princess's Gift, but that's not what the Pokemon's called. A little oh. Hit and Run for 50 damage onto that dumbbelled up trash monster. And Azul puts down Ditto Prism and a Colrus for seven. Yep, that Ditto Prism star opening up options. Could threaten a Garbotoxin later. Could threaten another Zoroark. I guess we don't know yet, but at any rate, he's got plenty of choices, and he's already in the driver's seat this game, and he's just looking to pull ahead even further. Just going to announce another knockout, and that one is on... The Wobbuffet over to Rob. Now, as we see from Rob's side, if he hit and runs, it's going to be into that GX Pokemon, Kartana. And uh, Azul only has two prizes left. And that oh, and the Shrine of Punishment going down. That's actually kind of insane right now because he's going to be dealing... Well, I wouldn't say it's an insane play. I think it's a good play. But it's just an insane situation to have where he's going to be dealing damage to his own Kartana at the same time. That's a trade-off. But that is, in fact, a trade-off, and it is going to be softening up for either a Trash Lance or a Riotus beating. But right now, it's a Hitmonchan in the active that Azul has to take on, has to be eyeing down. And trade number one, that's a Psychic Energy and a Dowsing Machine. Yeah, so we might have all of the pieces, and if we don't, we're probably just a single card off from being able to see Azul pull the win here. Trade number two, that is Parallel City and Rescue Stretcher. And uh, Azul's holding, I think before he drew that, he had eight cards, seven back up, maybe nine cards in there. Yeah, and he has a ton of options. It's just he doesn't have all the options he would need to win the game right now. Yeah, Azul would love to uh, to see uh, a, a Guzma, and the Versus Seeker certainly does that. And Rob and seems to riding on the wall and says, yeah, let's save some time. Let's save some time here. Pack them up, pack it in. Let's go to game two. You look at this matchup on paper again and again and again. We've said it. Zorark has that fighting weakness. These people are coming equipped with fighting decks. They're just not able to con uh, conquer the big bad uh, boy of Expanded. Um, what does Rob need to do in game two to, to get ahead here? Well, first thing he needs to do, not dead draw after the second or third turn. I think that always helps a lot. But... Given what Rob has here, I mean, of course, yeah, I think you alluded to it earlier, being able not only to get what you need, but, but be able to successfully chain it, getting the strong energies along with the ANSI. And sometimes you might have to maybe hold off on doing something. I'm not saying that I'm not saying that Rob did that last game. I feel like he played entirely to his outs, however few they were in that situation. But maybe in the next game, one thing we'll love to see is just a little bit more aggression and maybe with being able to hit all the cards he needs, chain all the cards he needs, score a couple clutch knockouts, and then maybe finish off something like a Tapu Lele with Shrine Pings. That's a great point. I, I, I really want to see Rob, uh, again, as you mentioned, not dead draw. Um, and these folks have gone right back into the action, so we're going to be jumping down to the game here. Rob is in the front with Wobbuffet. That is a, a key starter for him in this deck. That's, that's what he wants to, to see up front while he sets up. 
Um, and first, just a nest ball to get a, to get a friend on the buddy, mm -hmm. uh, to get a, a buddy on the bench for that Hitmonchan. Yeah, the core concept of the deck of, of hit and run is really coming down to just hitting and running for Wobbuffet. So you bring Wobbuffet up, you have Bide Barricade, effectively shutting off abilities like Trade. It's not going to shut off something like Tapu Lele's Wonder Tag because the only exception to Bide Barricade are psychic abilities, and of course Tapu Lele is a psychic type Pokemon. So nevertheless, I think that's what Rob wants to see. And going back to what you're asking, what we want to see more of, I think we want to see a return to some of those fundamentals of the deck and whether that was incidentally due to bad luck last game or whatever, just seeing more of that pure, simple strategy of the deck play out how it should. Rob gets a uh, Wobbuffet by Barricade, as you mentioned, off of that nest ball. And an adventure bag going to give him two tools to put uh, into his hand. Floatstone pulled to the front. I think that one's kind of a gimme. I think we could have uh, guessed that one in the dark. And a muscle band. Uh, really going to be able to do some good damage against uh, right now what's in the active, that resource management Oranguru. Yeah, and in a longer grindier game, that's actually a wonderful thing to threaten so early right now is a knockout on Oranguru, which is just so clutch in being able to recycle Azul's resources to be able to control the game and eventually to close it out. Let's see if Rob has a supporter to play here. Prism Energy, yes, that's coming down on the Hitmonchan. And just an N. So, yeah. not bad. For, not bad. Not a bad start for Rob here. Agreed, yeah. And I, I actually like the decision to play the Prism Energy right now because it's no guarantee by any means that he will hit a follow-up energy in his hand. So what he's doing is he's giving himself some insurance. He's giving himself the guarantee that he doesn't have to top deck an energy at least in order to be able to attack next turn. He's putting... Azul in the spot where he needs to be able to discard that prism somehow. Rob drawing six. Going to take a quick look. A uh, quick look, and that's another Hitmonchan that came down onto the bench. And I believe just a pass over to Azul. Yeah, and meanwhile, Azul's hand is looking pretty solid. I mean, we've got several options. Ultra Ball, Mysterious Treasure. He's not wanting for a setup for this upcoming turn, even with by Barricade in play, because all that's doing effectively is shutting off trade, which isn't going to be a factor until next turn. <laughs> Azul kind of jockeying back and forth, finally decides on that Garbotoxin Garbodor uh, like, to, to, to be pitched away to the mysterious <laughs> that treasure. Point, he's like, no, I want to save that Ultra Ball. I think I'm going to really need that, because, you know, there's this thing in my deck that's kind of relevant called Zorark. I mean, I, I attack with it sometimes. Most of the time I attack with Trash Alanche, but, you know, I, I kind of like it. Yeah, at least a draw. Uh, Tapu Lele, Mysterious Treasure. Uh, Tapu Lele off the Mysterious Treasure, obviously using that Wonder Tag ability to grab the Bridget that Azul is already in the process of resolving. Um, kind of the uh, order of the day here has kind of been Zorark, Zorark, uh, Trubbish. Uh, and there it is on cue, Zorark, Zorark, Trubbish. Quick look to the hand for Azul, and he's going to shuffle him in. And we're pressing on here in Game 2, Round 9 in Hartford. Yep, the winning in situation here. And I feel, you know, another thing about Rob's point of view in this whole situation is he's down a game, this is winning in, but he needs to go ahead and keep his calm. And I feel like that's what he's doing. He's sticking to his game plan, doing things as he should. But we need to see that continue out through the rest of the half hour. And make no mistake about it, I feel like if this is going to be a winning scenario, a winning match for Rob, then it would have to go to half an hour. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Rob doing uh, a quick uh, quick math here, going to bring up, uh, I don't think it necessarily matters because you're hitting for weakness here, uh, Rob, uh, but he brings up the Hitmonchan with a strong energy, knocking out a Zorua after a Guzma play, and now Rob kind of attacking the draw support Pokemon of Azul's deck and tucked safely behind a Wobbuffet. Yeah, although I'm curious to see if Trash Alanche will be able to factor in. Oh, and those cards are flying again, but they're back where they need to be. But anyways, I'm curious to see if Trash Alanche will get to be just as relevant as it was last game. We don't see that bodybuilding. Well, we have two copies of bodybuilding dumbbells in Azul's list, so of course the Zora gets to be a little aggressive. Then maybe he can transition into Trash Alanche later. 
a key difference from uh, game two to game one. Uh, was Azul able to Guzma up and start taking uh, proactive knockouts rather than reactive ones? Um, and that's Zorak GX just staying in the active after picking up some weights. And Rob has the opportunity here to, to do some real damage onto this Zorak GX. Yeah, and going down Rob's list one more time, I don't see any field blower, meaning that that bodybuilding will stick there. So Zorak, in this situation, might prefer to have a weakness policy, but in general is just totally content having the extra 40 HP. So even the more extreme fringe situations, that Zorak should still be able to survive a combo of hits from Rob. Guzma on the ditto prism. Hitmonchan coming up, and this is another little hit-and-run knockout on a um, fighting weak Pokemon. Hey, and this is the best of both worlds from what you were talking about earlier, right? Because you were saying, okay, it looks like Rob's going for the draw support, and by going for the Ditto Prism Star, that is just such a clutch play because in addition to going for the future draw support of another Zoroark, he's also blocking out an option for Azul to have a Nether Garbodor in case he commits himself to one over the other. Taking that knockout there also puts Rob back on even prizes uh, for, you know, those EXGX knockout, knockouts, making that a little bit cleaner to get to six. So uh, got to respect that. DCE coming down onto the Zorark GX. Colrus being played, and that's going to be a Colrus for seven. Not the strongest Colrus we've, we've seen, but uh, Azul's got to be happy with getting seven new ones. Yeah, although the curious thing about this board state is that normally... Azul and Zorak players in general should be able to easily knock out something like this Wobbuffet, but he actually has to draw and bench the basic here. And we're five, six, it looks like that's a dowsing machine, so he could find a roundabout way to knock out this Wobbuffet, but I don't even know if it would be worth it to do. Yeah, Dowsing Machine could, uh, you know, maybe grab an Ultra Ball or a Mysterious Treasure, mm -hmm. uh, allow Azul to jump back into the deck and get that fifth Pokemon for the bench. However, as you mentioned, um, Azul elects not to do that, just hits in for 100. That Wobbuffet uh, holding the Floatstone in front, a little banged up, but st still sticking in there. Yep, that Wobbuffet's holding the line, and I think a big reason why is because Azul evaluated the cards and his resources and decided that that would just be too risky. It just wouldn't be worth it losing all those resources to knock out something as insignificant as a Wobbuffet. A Guzma on a Zorua, a slice off by Cartana GX on the DCE, and Rob taking his third knockout of the game, down to three prizes, and uh, no DCE, no energy in play on Azul's side of the board, and only access to one Zorark GX as it stands right now. Yeah, and a very smart chain of operations, sequencing by Rob, by first retreating, bringing up that Hitmonchan, deactivating his own by barricade to be able to use his metal Pokemon's ability. Oh, uh, DC coming down on the Zorak. Wait, do we double attach here? Hey, do we have do we have a double attachment? Do, do we have it? Did didn't do he we? Didn't he slice off? Is, is that a brand? It, yeah, is that a didn't brand? Didn't he slice off the DCE? Attaches? Yeah, DCE I, I and don't play think, a psychic. Yeah, I don't think I saw any energy on before. I, I think I saw a perfectly clear board. Yeah, after because that slice he, off. he sliced off the DCE. So it was clear. The Zorak was clear, and he just put the Psychic down on the Trubbish. I think uh, I think Azul, good game. Uh, just double attach. We, we have Jeff running over to, uh, to take a quick look. Um, Go ahead and confirm. And you know what? I think we might even be able to look through our handy-dandy footage to be 110% sure that did not happen. Yeah. And that's the great thing about having rewinds is we might be able to figure that out, catch it as soon as we can, and then get this resolved yeah see if we can rectify it we have uh we, we have the the judge scampering around here uh gonna take a look um and you know that's that's uh, that's all we can ask for we're just trying to do our best here um and if anything looks suspect make sure we bring it up if it's all if it's all hunky dory by all means we're maintaining tournament integrity uh, and move forward as is yeah uh, and sometimes you do have a catch and you, you got to take care of it so oh for sure and i mean like it would be better it would be better to air on the side of caution as opposed to just, oh, something's kind of off. Oh, let's not say anything about it. And then you have an issue where there actually is a double attachment. And I guess we're still looking to go ahead and just pick through, comb through the footage, get that dealt with, and then get this match back on the road to where it's supposed to be, which is 
a good final match of the tournament where these players are in their winning in trying to figure out just who's going to be able to advance today to who isn't and then go from there yeah absolutely so we're, we're taking a look here um azul i think they peeled so would uh sierra if you don't mind jumping us back down to the game uh we'll take a look at what's going on here yeah so it looks like that's been rectified so the psychic energy issue has been dealt with they we we were able to catch that double attachment in time, and so I don't know the specifics of how they've rectified it because it looked like they were already drawing cards for it. Yeah, this is how I think it was backed up. I think Azul was still shuffling head and drawn cards. So since he attached the DCE first and the Psychic second, what happened is the Psychic got thrown into the deck because it would have still been in his hand as part of the end resolution. Yeah, and so since it's, he was it's still a real shuffling it, and hadn't drawn anything. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a moot point. However, you know, what that does for Azul is he can't attack with the Trash Lynch Garbodor. Yeah, and that could have been absolutely huge. I mean, I'm not saying that that would help him too much here with that Wobbuffet, but later in the game that could be absolutely crucial, especially given the fact that Rob is within firing range of a lot of Azul's Pokemon. Yep, and uh, that bodybuilding dumbbells on that uh, Trash Lange Garbodor uh, makes it harder for that Hitmon, uh, Hitmonchan to knock out because it isn't fighting weak. Um, so just something to keep in mind, Rob playing down Shrine of Punishment. It's been a long time coming, but it is finally down being able to ping away at those EX, GX Pokemon. And I think this might be Rob's best out to be able to close this game out if he is going to close it out. Correct. Rob putting, uh, playing down uh, a Karina, which is uh, search your deck for a fighting Pokemon and an item card. So uh, pretty useful in uh, especially the expanded format where there's a lot of powerful items and the the oh, Pokemon you know of what? choice is Deancey. and Deancey and Choice Band. That's choice band. that's 120 damage right there. Yep. So by getting by getting the Deancey and by getting the Choice Band, he's instantly doubled, effectively doubled the amount of damage that he's going to be dealing with this Hitmonchan this turn. Choice but band. I think even with Choice Band, it might not it's gonna, be. It's going to fall a little short. Yeah. Uh, 30, 60 with Choice Band, 80, 100, 200, Shrine of Punishment tick. Did I do my math wrong? I don't believe I did. 200 Shrine tick, 210. Congratulations, my friend, the math major. <laughs> I, that is a, that I was is certainly not that. I was, uh, to be honest, the moment he pulled those out, I just started doing the math because I needed the yeah. the extra forty five seconds the, to make hey, to know figure what? it out. You know what, man? You got it right. You got the results right, and that's all that counts. And that's a big part of the game is making sure you get those calculations right. And it isn't quite as much of an issue when you have two really good players like these and a really good judge all in the room together to parse it out in case there is a mistake, but. At any rate, in planning out your decisions, that's really crucial. And even though it's just a bit short, it's still a good play, and it forces Azul to do something awkward like maybe parallel zone Zorak away, even though he only has one Zorak in play. Azul just played uh, a Bridget, filling up those bench with, uh, with a couple more Trubbish, and just trying to get Pokemon down that he can use and actually start dealing some damage. Zorark is going to uh oh he's gonna take, take the out. ping damage oh i think that you know what rob if he has a guzma he might be one card away from winning this because if he he would get three prizes he would get his two prizes off the warring guru and then he'd be able to see the zorak get knocked out in between turns to the shrine ping so the shrine ping uh that zorak currently sitting at 220 damage 230, 240, 250. You need, you need to flop back and forth three more times. Yeah, but you know what? Even then, uh, yeah, that, that is true. You would have to uh, wait a little bit longer, but even with that, this is a great position for Rob to be in, and even if he's caught in having to do something grimy and uncomfortable, like knock out a Zoroark, that might be okay, too, because with all those Pokemon on the bench on Azul's side, those are three prime targets for knockouts later. It's just a question of does Rob have the resources to follow up with it? I feel like I missed what card Rob played. He's shuffling a lot of cards around, uh, computer search and a fighting Pokemon. Um, and I believe that's because uh, Rob may have versus secret for a Karina. Yeah, so even if he doesn't have something resembling a win this turn, he's setting himself up well, saying, hey, you know what, Azul, go ahead and play your end, end me down to one. I'm ready for it. Uh, Hitmon Lee coming down. 
um, a special combo, if you hit and run the last turn, a uh, special combo comes in and deals a uh, modified amount of damage, which is currently escaping me yeah, right now, it, unfortunately. It, yeah, and I really like that play because even if Azul ends Rob down to one and has an energy, even with that, uh, Rob can threaten winning the game on just a single energy with Hitmonlee because, I, again, there are a couple really great targets on the bench for him to knock out. Zul playing an Ultra Ball. Are those two Zorak GXs getting thrown away? You know, I think they are. But then again, it looks like at this rate, basically Azul's just resigned himself to not dealing with Zorak anymore. It is all on garb and just basically, or maybe it's a little less than all on garb. Maybe it's just a concession right there. Azul going to pack it up, pack wow. it in. Uh, Rob takes a, a very swift game two, and we're going to be jumping into uh, game three in round nine uh, with over 20 minutes left. That's right, over 20 minutes left and a lot of pressure to get it done. But with the way that these two games have moved, I'm pretty confident it's going to happen. Plus, both of these players know it, know that this is it. They need to see a winner in this match in order for somebody to go on. It's more efficient for there to be a winner than both players to go home and be like, oh, okay, well, I finished in top 64. No, they're here to win the tournament. They want to win the tournament. And so because of that, we aren't going to see any shenanigans where they are playing for a tie or anything like that. We're going to see a really good, clean, exciting game with a little bit under 20 minutes left. So there's going to be a bit of pressure to grind to the finish line, but I think they're going to get there, and it's going to be great. Great pool. Uh, great point. Azul, good game. Uh, known for going to tournaments and taking them down, and Rob Guerrero looking for that day two with Azul GG in his way. That's just a good storyline. If, if Rob gets to say, round nine, I beat one of the best players in the game to set myself up for a good run in day two, you can't really get too upset with that these players are shuffled up they're cutting each other's decks and we are about ready to go here game three round nine winning in scenario both of these players sitting at 17 points a draw does not guarantee them top eight or excuse me top 32 and as a matter of fact it locks them out of being able to advance today too where seeing a winner in this game is their way to stay alive and maybe see their way to that five thousand dollar prize at the end of the weekend uh, you couldn't be more correct. Mr. Kettler Woo! jumping down to the game. Uh, Azul is not jumping down to the game. We, we are being told we might have a pause. So we might have a pause. And we're back. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, sometimes it, things happen. It's not a big deal. Yep. A lot of stuff going on back here behind the scenes. You just got to nav navigate to the best of your ability. Uh, Absolutely. From the last I heard, Maximum Security won the Kentucky Derby, uh, but may have fouled out, got DQ'd to uh, open it up for Country Home, uh, which was like a 93-1 to one shot. It was pretty low on the totem pole there in terms of betting odds. So, what did it get DQ'd? Um, I believe cutting off the other horses. Uh, in its in its uh, path to taking the lead, it, it cut some other horses off. I don't know. I don't oh, know. So it cheated. Yeah, you know, can't be doing that. Yeah. You can't be doing that. Not in this game, not in horse racing, That's not right. in anything. Don't you, cheat. You got to play with integrity. Play yeah. with integrity, play with spirit of the game, and that applies to everything. It applies to Pokemon. It applies to the Kentucky Derby. So I don't care if you're a horse. That's not a good excuse. You have to be a sportsman. You got to put it on the jockey there that didn't take care of his horse. The horse follows the jockey. Yeah. Um, not that I know that much about horse racing. <laughs> um, uh but, but I blame the horse. But but maximum security, heavy favorite. Ran in the mud. It was a disaster down in Louisville today. Tons of rain, muddy conditions. Cobbled together what they thought was a clean win, and then country home. Yeah, and so it's second place finisher, now winner based on DQ. And so it looks like we're getting some word from the booth here that we might be able to this might be a longer pause than what we're expecting. Trying to get more details on what the pause is all about. But we're actually looking for the possibility of maybe chatting for a bit while we wait on the game three action to commence. So let's go ahead and take a look at the comments in the thread. And by the way, we don't know why the pause is going on. <laughs> so that is the best question I have read. What happened? We don't know what happened. We're, yeah, we're we'll not sure find out as soon as you guys do. Um, you so, will find so out. So looking at the chat real quick, uh, it's country uh, house. So pile of apologies there. And uh, another thing I saw was cheating, question mark, just say nay. 
like <laughs> hey, like a horse may. So very clever. Very good out That's there. That's adorable. Uh, so if you're in front and can't see behind you, how can you be in the path of others to cut them off? Sounds like nonsense to me. Like I said, I don't know much of anything about horse racing. Um, uh, what happened? We're still trying to... Uh, to, to figure that out and we're getting the spin the wheel signal and we are back at it yeah and you know what it's still a mystery folks we don't know why it got paused maybe there was something that we that the judges thought was going on but ultimately didn't happen i mean your guess is as good as mine we'll eventually find out as all things work out the truth shines itself on everything but for now we're just going back to the action momentarily and it looks like these players are ready to get things going here in probably the most stressful game of the whole tournament for them. Yeah, uh, what was a mystery is now history. Natural Bridget out of the hand for Azul Good Game and uh, just sticking with his comfort order off that Bridget, Zora Zora Trubbish, going to shuffle up and set himself up for success here in this round nine, game three. And I believe this is the first turn Azul has gotten to go first or first game that Azul's gotten to go first, which I, is worth noting. I believe so, and it's a really threatening setup right now where normally what we see in the typical stabilized beginning turn for Zora Garb is to have those two Zorua and the one Trubbish, but I can't state enough, I can't stress enough how having that third Zorua is just so huge in terms of domino effects here. So we need, effectively by having three Zorua in play, he's going to get about 50% more draw, 50% more options, 50% more disruption, everything. Rob quickly uh, putting a floatstone down. I believe that is on the Hitmon Lee. Uh, Shrine of Punishments and Karina going to grab Nest Ball and another uh, and a Hitmon Chan. Nest Ball looks like is going to eye down a Wobbuffet. Rob getting his setup going. A key thing to note about Azul Good Game's uh, setup uh, is he did not have to play Tapu Lele to get his bench established yep. which uh with that shrine of punishment ever looming is uh, is a critical point that is a huge boon right now and not just because of avoiding ping damage from the shrine because he didn't have to play a tapu lele for that he will have that tapu lele available later in the game to be able to get one of those clutch supporter cards like guzma uh, Rob, uh, putting down a Marshadow Let Loose, uh, shuffle it in. Each player draws four. It's effectively, as I like to say, the supporter judge stapled on a Pokemon. Yeah, and this might be the first chance we get in this match to really see the Bide Barricade combo work in the best way that it can because last game we really didn't see that happen quite as much because Rob was able to get such an aggressive start. We didn't see it in the first game because... Rob's start was so slow, and his hand wasn't that good. But now Azul's setup is so dependent on those trades. And because it's so dependent on those trades, by getting by Barricade into play in the active position, Rob might be able to pull this game out. Hoopa with the Scoundrel Guard ability protects it from EXs and GXs. Uh, going to retreat that Hitmonlee into it and just pass right on over to Azul. Parallel City throws away the Shrine of Punishment. Ditto Prism comes down. Zorark GX eats a DCE, and then a Sycamore clean seven. Wow. Talk about a <laughs> heck of a let loose Marshadow. I don't think uh, Azul could have asked for a much better set of four, four cards plus draw uh, than he got there. So Azul first trade is Azorua. Draw two. There's a Zorark GX. Let's trade again. And I think Rob might have seen something I didn't in the last turn by bringing up that Hoopa because Azul's naturally exploding right now, and had he not had the Hoopa up, then whatever he did have in the active position would have been right as beaten into oblivion just now. But because Hoopa's sitting there right now, it's going to be shielded from EXGX damage. Right as beating ain't going to be dealing anything to it. Depending on what Rob's uh, discard looks like, how many items? Not that many. And Azul's only way through this Hoopa is with Trash Lanch Garbodor. Um, or to play around it. Obviously, that always remains an option when you have cards like Guzma. So um, Azul going to try and craft a game plan that uh, doesn't allow him to be completely uh, ran out of this game by that Hoopa. Exactly. And right now, I, I think that this is going precisely the way that both players do not want it to go because while Azul has an absolutely incredible setup it's not the sort of explosive oh but wait we have the I might stand corrected here 
seconds after what I'm saying, because if we see that Garbotoxin with the Floatstone come into play and a way to get that Oranguru out of the active position, we might actually see a knockout on this Hoopa. Interesting that he's not evolving the Ditto, but he might shut down abilities. Is the Ditto new? I think it's new. Oh, we've got two Floatstone mm. going down. So we have the Free Retreat, we have the Garbotoxin to shut off the abilities, and we've got the Knock Knockout on Hoopa. <laughs> Azul crafting it up, showing him why he's one of the best in the game, kind of taking everything into consideration. And you know what, just to spike the ball, he almost played the body building dumbbells, but was like, no, I want to hold on to it for a little while. Maybe it'll be relevant later. Something uh, to just just throw out there is now uh, Azul's trades are offline. Um, so that is just an important thing to note that they're permanently locked. Doesn't matter. You can't Guzma around Rob's uh, Wobbuffet and activate those. He's just, they're just shut off. So Azul, I hope he has another draw supporter in hand to kind of get, get the, the engine uh, moving yet again. However, a great series of events for Azul takes a big knockout on a very, very annoying card on Rob's side of the board. And uh, Rob needs to match that intensity here with a good solid amount of damage onto a Pokemon on Azul's oh, side. Oh, and we have the Buzzwool coming down as a potential attacking option later on and a little bit of draw power so I was a bit concerned that Rob was going to have another one of those dead draw scenarios does not have that instead he can threaten some damage on the Zora keep himself in the game and hopefully one of these players can pull out a win before time's called Rob does have a nice little beast energy tucked away in the deck which the Buzzwool can pick up once Azul goes to four prizes that's right, so it's sitting there. It's threatening Azul right now, but the question is how it's going to deal out, and I think if Azul might be sitting on some way to address his own board state that he's created by playing the floatstones like a field blower on himself, he could evolve that Ditto Prism Star into a Trash Lanch Garbodor, hit for big damage, and that might be the reason why we saw him save the bodybuilding dumbbells from earlier, so that that can come in, swing for a bunch of damage, and not get revenge killed. Rob Sycamore uh, found some cards, uh, didn't play many down, just the Buzzwool before. Sycamore into no energy and is forced just to pass uh, into Azul's very big board. Um, and Azul just has a knockout on this Wobbuffet. However, it will trigger the Buzzwool, so that is uh, the Buzzwool Sledgehammer turn. So it is worth noting there. Yeah, and I'd absolutely say that's a saving grace. So because he can instantly even up the prize exchange if that happens then things would be looking up for him and so we see a little bit of a careful slow deliberation on that field blower because how he does this is going to be important discarding the float stone to deactivate his garbotoxin getting that ditto prism stars ability back online and he's golden versus seeker uh, i believe announcing sycamore that is seven going to the grip for azul Going to take an easy knockout on this Wobbuffet and say, all right, Rob, I'm ready for the swing around turn. Not a big deal. Yeah, although I'm interested here to see just how this will deal out because he, it seems like if he doesn't get that Trash on Inch Guard boat or involved now, then there's a little bit of a window of opportunity for Rob to preempt that. And by that I mean being able to just find some way to knock it out, keep it from ever growing up to become a Trash Lanch Garbodor, and then relying on his fighting type advantage to deal with the Zoroarks. Easy knockout on the Wobbuffet. Um, that Hitmonlee carrying the Floatstone steps into the active uh, with those long, long legs. And Rob going to see what he can do. Had a weird draw off the Sycamore last turn. With no energy and no way to attack, I think. Even if he just had an attack to, build, to be able to pull off, that would have made such a difference. But no real, no real pressure on that Zoroark, unfortunately, for him. But he's still got the knockout, so it's going to be a 4-4 game. Uh, um, Prism Energy going on to uh, Buzzwool, a muscle band. Not necessary uh, to take this knockout this time around. Yeah. Um, but we'll make the following sledgehammers outside of the key turn, air quotes, uh, a little bit more impactful if it comes to that. Taking a quick look at uh, Azul's discard. Rob t goes back into the tank, takes a look at the grip. Yeah, and we've got... A l and that's the thing about 
the prize card triggering of the Ultra Beast damage effects and their effects in general is that we could have a really awkward scenario where a th with, th with four prizes left, Azul could bring up and knock out the Sledgehammer Buzzwool, the baby Buzzwool. That would put him at three prizes, but that would be one prize too many for Nihilego to come in, swoop in, and then nightcap for a knockout. So he might actually have to wait before being able to address that huge 160 HP garb. Or what he could do is, if he has the resources, to be able to knock out something else. That way he can at least put up some pressure. Adventure's back for Rob. Couple damage modifying items going to the hand. Nihilego, as you were just talking about, it comes down, joins the fray versus Seeker. Sycamore gonna pitch some more items. Uh, Deancey Prism goes down, has no way to bump that stadium just yet. And I believe the other card was a Hitmonchan there after the Sycamore going to the, to the discard. And this is where the decision to run parallel is your stadium of choice over Skyfield is so impactful because by having that in play, that's effectively starved Rob out of untold amounts of damage for the rest of this game. Zul feeling pretty comfortable uh, just by the body language I'm picking up here. Uh, with the current situation on the board, it seemed like he almost expected the Buzzwool to come up and take that knockout, which is why he never committed the bodybuilding dumbbells to the active. Um, a strong energy uh, instead of a prism energy on that buzzwool would have been an easy criteria for a knockout, uh, even uh, muscle band prism, things and, like and that. There's that trash alanche garb threatening that baby buzzwool being effectively ready to knock it out right now. But in addition to that, being able to knock out just about anything else that Rob could bring up. Um because Buzzwool Psychic Week, that Trash Lanch has uh, an easy time, will have an easy time dispatching it. Um, Azul, again, as you mentioned, will go down to three cards. We'll still be ahead in the prize, in prizes. And and because Rob doesn't have any sort of um, Wobbuffet in play or energy or uh, ability denial in play, Azul's going to be able to trade as we see it now. Two trades, filling his hand back up after an end to four. And now Mysterious Treasure throwing away an N and just going to keep thinning uh, thinning cards out of his deck. Over and over again. He's going all in with this one Garb Trash Alanche. So he's not even worrying about setting up a second. He's like, you know what? If something happens to this 160 HP Garb that I can't anticipate, then so be it. Because at this point, because of the way that Rob's board is set up, he can't really do a whole lot. Where he, I mean, unless he has the perfect card combination to score a knockout on the bench, then he's really struggling to find an answer. And I'm a little concerned if I were Rob that that nightcap Neolego is going to get knocked out. So he might, he might not even be able to respond to the garb with that. We are into Rob's turn. Ask Azul how many cards he's got. Azul flicking those around pretty quickly. And now Rob needs to find a way to respond in turn uh, to that big knockout on um, on Rob's Pokemon. Guzma pulling up the Garbotox and Garbodor. I believe that was an enhanced hammer getting rid of the DCE. Yeah, and I think that's a pretty cool defensive Guzma play right there because he sees that Azul is heavily committed, has already heavily committed his floatstones. But whether or not Rob knows it, Azul runs four copies of floatstones, so it's really not that big of a deal for him to dig a little bit, find it, and at the same time commit some floatstones early game. First trade is a parallel city. Guzma in the grip. Pull up uh, Trash Lanch Garbodor and the Nihilego, take a knockout, and now Rob, all of Rob's kind of comeback Pokemon, those Ultra Beasts, um, find themselves in the discard after being uh, unceremoniously dispatched of. And Rob has a lot of questions to be answered and doesn't seem to be uh, anywhere close to having that amount. Oh, exactly. And so at this point, Rob is one out to being able to address that huge HP Garb no longer around, no longer with us, buried in the graveyard. And so he's just got a couple, he's got a Hitmonchan, he's got a Hitmonlee, but that, I don't see that being enough to be able to bring him. But there's a little sliver of hope in that Gumi being able to pull off some sort of surprise here. 
I'm interested to see if... Uh, well, I mean, with how few energies actually been committed or discarded by Azul. I, I, it's tough to say, but the Gumi is some sort of possible out. Maybe if not this turn, maybe next. Uh, Azul swinging over the 30 damage dice. Rob said, I'm not quite ready yet. Let me take a look at this discard. Uh, Prism <laughs> Energy onto the Hitmonchan. It will be hitting and running. Uh, into the Guzma or to the Wobbuffet is going to be the question. I think I said Guzma and Wabafet. Into the Gumi uh, or into the Wabafet. Although, at the same time, I, I, it, uh, unless Azul's heavily committed his resources to something else, he should already have a response in his hand. If it's not a Guzma, he might even have a way to knock out this Gumi, like just attaching the psychic energy. Uh. A parallel City almost coming down. Azul says, no, I need to trade first. I need to get this information before I make decisions. Um, parallel City finding its way. And then, nope, switch to N. There's a DCE, so the attacks can continue. Rescue Stretcher. Searching, searching, searching. Trubbish back on the bench. And we saw Azul earlier playing around with the idea of not putting out a second garb. But now he's just threatening that. He's like, you know what? I've got it. And... Even if you do something with this garb, I'm going to go ahead and secure my game beyond 100%. Yep, and the field blower is going to be uh, putting the final nail in the coffin. Rob has to dejectedly and sheepishly promote a Gumi with the sticky membrane ability, but as we know, Azul does have a DCE in hand. Uh, he has uh, access to his abilities, and Rob playing a desperate teammate's um, he could have a whole football field worth of teammates out there, and I don't think he'd get all the help he needed. Yeah, because even with all of what's been going on, even with all the com all, all, committing all these resources all over the place on Azul's side, he still has that Oren Guru sitting there. So even if Rob pulled off some sort of miraculous, really clever play, I think Azul would just be able to play something to get out of it, resource management, and then eventually get the win at some point. Uh, Rob. But, but he's probably just sitting on his, his hand right now, so it's not exactly like he's struggling that much. Well, I think Azul feels incredibly comfortable. Rob did play teammates, the supporter of the turn, uh, and Rob looking through yeah. the deck says, I have no combination of two cards that will allow me to pull myself out of this bind. And Azul, good game. Azul Garcia Griego finds himself in yet another day two in an expanded event that you and I are covering, and the, the guy almost seems unstoppable. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's the thing, though, is that in order to get to this point, in order to be at a win and in round, he had to have taken a loss at some point, and so he was able to get past that, and I think that's a sign of a really good player is you take your lumps at some point, but you still recover, and even if you are a little bit down, relatively further down the tables, you keep on playing, keep on winning, and then you get into an exciting make or break it situation like this, and you show everybody, hey, regardless of what my matchups might have been, regardless of what my earlier games in the tournament were like, here I am, I'm going to go ahead and put on my skills for everybody, show you what it's about. And on that note, it looks like we will be having a player interview, a winner interview really soon, so don't go away.
Hey trainers, welcome back to the 2019 Pokemon Trading Card Game Regional Championships. Closing out the night, I am here with our winning in round nine winner, Azul GG Garcia Griego. Tell me a little bit about your deck choice, because I, I know that you've been tinkering with some different stuff. You've played different things in the different expanded tournaments since yep. Toronto. So how did you and maybe your teammates decide on going with Zorar Garb today? Um, I mean, it's mostly Pendarvis, but um, we just wanted something. We don't want to, like, we knew Picaram was really good and going to be, be the most popular deck, but we don't want to sit there and play a bunch of Picaram mirror matches where it's, oh, whoever hit the full blitz first, who plays Coco GX and so on. So we came up with a, a Zorak deck that can beat Pika, um, be consistent through that, um, and then just had just able to beat everything else. It's, like, very favorite against Archie Stoys, uh, pretty favorite against the Hitmonchan deck, as, uh, as you saw on stream there. Um, he didn't draw too well, but like even if he had drawn a little bit better, the dumbbells. Uh, you felt Garbador, pretty good in like, that yeah, third yeah. game, especially for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, we just wanted something that could like beat the stuff we expected to show up, um, and and that's what it does. Um, yeah, I didn't want to play Picaram ourselves. That's basically it. Cool. And, and we saw in basically this exact same format, different variations of Zorark do well. How do you feel like? your list does against those so i mean we've got a couple things we could choose from like zorark toad which we didn't really see that much this tournament and things like zorark control how do you feel like how, how do you feel about zorark mirror um i mean the zoro garb uh, like the zoro garb skyfield matchup i think is close uh zoro toad i have i have no idea we ha i mean we have the the fava and the orangaroo so we can like loop that against them mm -hmm. um i guess but i'd imagine it's it's close you also have like you know fava plus garbage collection put it back on top but we didn't really expect it to show up so we weren't like really too worried about it, but we had like you know we have a couple strategies we can uh, execute against them, and I, I, I didn't see any. I think I saw one Frank Diaz. Uh, I think I saw him playing it, but besides that, I did not see a single Zoro toad. We didn't expect very very much. I expected very little Zoro garb as well. And I didn't see any of that really either. Um, but like the matchups are fine, and then like the control the control Zork is probably pretty rough. Um, but th that's like you know so minimally played. You know it's not worth worrying about. Right. So you really don't feel particularly worried about any matchup left in the tournament. No, not really. Um, I don't really want to play against more Pika Roms. I already played against like five of them today, but I'm probably going to be playing against like five more Pika Roms. Yeah, so, so even then, I mean, if, if you went, it, did you lose against any Pika Rom? I lost against one. I went uh, four and one uh, overall. It was just, uh, you know, they got to let loose one of the games, and then the other game, you know, I didn't have a Zora count until turn three or four. So 80% still a pretty solid record against yeah. a matchup, though, so it sounds like it's pretty favorable based yeah, off it, of that yeah. alone. <laughs> yeah, so. it's definitely favorable, yeah. but it's like it's nerve wracking. It, it always comes down to end, end to one, end to two, and you're like, I mean, if they hit it, they win, but I mean it's just one game sometimes. So yeah, it's like definitely favorable, but it's it's, it's a stressful matchup. It always comes down to the end to one or two, and yeah, it's just nerve wracking. Well, hey, cool. So I tell you what, with that, I'll go ahead and leave it at that for the night. Congratulations on another day two, man. Thanks, Kevin. And with that, we are officially going to close out the night for day one of the regional championships. We would like to thank FullGripGames.com for their sponsorship, and we all will see you back tomorrow for day two of this regional.